Thank you for coming together again. I know it's been a little while since we've had one of these updates. It's been about a month, in fact, because of some scheduling issues. Uh, so thank you for coming. It's good to see everybody again. I will start, as we always do, by recognizing our amazing faculty and staff who are bringing in external grants for the university to support their work. And since we met last, so it's been about four weeks, there's been about $3.5 million brought in in external funding. That's amazing, isn't it? Uh, so uh, Ms. Jessica Zavala, Patty Thornborough, uh, Ruth Samara, and then Dr. Harry Civic, and Dr. Brent Schofield, and Dr. Uh, Kazimov. I do want to highlight Dr. Schofield, though, because in science, there's really some prestigious recognition you get for the quality of your work. And over the course of five years, he's been granted about $3 million for an NIH R01, which is just absolutely amazing. So really thrilled to have him as part of our team. I also wanna recognize that we have a retiring member of Neomed, Mr. Tom Scoble will be retiring. And on Thursday, we're having an event for him up in the library I believe it's from nine until 11 o'clock. So if you have some time, please come up, have some coffee and refreshments and join us and um, sending him off with a, um, with a warm hug um, uh, virtually or figuratively given the <laughs> pandemic. Uh, I also wanna recognize that we've got a lot of ceremonies and events taking place over the course of the next few weeks. One of those is a, a really a celebration of our community today at 1215. It's uh, entitled Our Cultures, Our Community, and it's the unveiling of the beautiful set of flags that we have outside in the Watunakunakorn Auditorium or Atrium area. And it represents 49 different countries that members of our community are here from. So I look forward to that. And I thank um, Sandra Emmerich and her team, as well as the communications team for putting that on for us. I do need to announce that we have canceled the casino night. Many of you have seen that. The casino night was supposed to be November 5th and it was a fundraiser for our uh, free clinic that the students run. Unfortunately, the pandemic made it difficult for us to continue forward with it. The good news is the pandemic is on a significant uh, downward decline or decline, I guess that's uh, repetitive. Um, fortunately, in Ohio, we are about 50% of where we were only five weeks ago. The peak was right around September 14th. Uh, and right now we're about half of the number of cases per day on average, looking over a two week period. So that is good, but it just didn't seem right for us to be able to do this right now and take the risk of having a super spreader event. And it's really not an event that is um, set up well for people to be monitored for vaccines coming in or for max masking. So we chose not to do that. I also wanna recognize one of our outstanding students in the entire group of students who put this on, but Nupur um, uh, Goyal, who is one of our third year medical students, really her and her team conceived of created and then this last week uh, managed to completely conduct a TEDx event for the very first time on our campus. So it's TEDx Neomed, Neomed and the theme was a call to heal, healing ourselves, our neighbors in our world. And 11 speakers did an absolutely amazing job over the course of a four hour evening that included a meal uh, if, if you didn't catch it or didn't manage to be able to come to part of the event, there will be videos online available. I think it was absolutely amazing. And if you look at the students who presented, we're used to seeing our students as um, really open minds coming in and learning from us. Uh, but what we don't see is how we can learn from them oftentimes and just amazing stories on their thoughts and the impact that they've had on our world. So I encourage you to watch that if you have an opportunity to do so. COVID-19, we haven't been able to avoid this term now for almost two years. Uh, the good news, as I said, is the reductions are happening. Uh, we've had one case that actually occurred uh, that we knew about officially uh, within the last week. Uh, 
Uh, in the last two weeks, there have been three cases. Those were a mix of vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. Our faculty and staff are currently at 94% vaccinated and our students are at 98.4% vaccinated. So we remain a very safe campus. I'm very pleased with where we are. And there have been some changes. As you know, state law now says that there can be no differentiated, no differentiation between vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals within the measures that you create. Uh, the only one that they do allow is um, making vaccination status a requirement for employment. Uh, we're watching that unroll as every university and many other institutions in the state have mandated vaccines. Uh, however, as I've mentioned before, this is Ohio and we are required to allow exemptions. And those exemptions are for religious reasons, for medical reasons, or for matters of conscience, which covers a whole litany of other reasons that people feel very, very strongly about. Neomeds is not in place until December 17th for full vaccination. Um, many of the others in the state are going to be doing it and have it fully in effect now in November. So we'll be watching very closely as we see it um, roll out. But I feel like we're, where we're going to be, uh, and for those who need the exemptions, we'll get the exemptions in place. Uh, again, very, very safe campus, and I think we've all done an incredible job. The um, strategic implementation programming for our new strategic plan is also going very, very well. I wanted to make sure that all of you were aware that we do have the strategic initiative funding available. I was a million dollars in funds for this fiscal year alone that uh, is available for members of our community to come up with a concept, figure out what the funding should be, what the impact from it will be, and how it will affect the broader university goals of our strategic plan. And then come to Lacey Madison's team, put in a request. It gets reviewed by uh, many of your peers and folks who are managing the strategic plan implementation and we're awarding dollars. We've now awarded $340,000 already this year. I'll highlight three of the programs to give you a, a sense of what they're about. One of those is a, a new writing center. And that new writing center is going to be staffed um, with additional personnel and capabilities. And they are here to help our students and our faculty, especially in the areas of scientific-based writing, which will help with grants it will help with getting new publications out and really support not just our educational endeavor, but our research endeavors here at the university. We also had a student team ask for funding. And I think the initiative was amazing that they're, they're creating the Neomed research, medical research journal. Uh, and they're gonna run a full journal publication like any other peer reviewed journal this is a good experience for them coming in to learn how to not just publish and how to promote and propagate the work of students and the faculty that they're working with in a journal that's branded with Neomed, but also to teach them what it takes to publish. And for those who want to go in that direction, how do you become an editor and what does it take to actually run a journal like the Journal of the American Medical Association or Nature? And the third one that we are um, funding is a diversity documentary program that the College of Medicine requested funding for as part of our diversity initiative. And that's creating short segment videos to tell the stories of what we're doing and the accomplishments that we've had at this university. This is a big month for our pharmacists. This is the um, recognition of pharmacy, pharmacist month. Uh, and in part of that celebration, the pharmacy students are throwing an ice cream social on Wednesday at noon. And so if you have an opportunity, please come and join them for some ice cream and to support the uh, College of Pharmacy. Those same students from the College of Pharmacy or a group of students from the Co College of Pharmacy are also creating an initiative for raising money in recognition of breast cancer awareness. Uh, with that, they're going, they've created a, a lapel pin that is uh, pink in color, representing the, um, the initiatives around breast cancer. Uh, they will be selling those today, I believe today and tomorrow. If you have an opportunity to purchase those, those dollars will all go to cancer research funding and cancer support funding. 
So I encourage you to do that and to support our students. Vitals, which is our new program in healthcare leadership. Uh, and again, it's using the tools that represent the word vitals, which is value, innovate, value innovation, technology, advocacy, leadership, and service uh, in how we improve healthcare. Uh, that program is in its second year. It's really doing amazingly well. Those who've attended talk about the incredible talks and the discussions that are taking place around critical issues in healthcare access and delivery. And uh, this next month's program will be on November, uh, I believe it's November 4th. Yeah, and it's Dr. Art Papier, who is a, he's a thought leader in information technology and healthcare. And he's also the CEO and founder of a company called Visual DX which we use uh, and part of our philanthropy has given us access to and it allows you to do things like understand how to deliver health care in a way that's much more comparable across all races because instead of just looking at pictures of disease processes on a caucasian male skin it, for instance it gives you full access to what a disease process manifestation would be like on people of all colors. So it's a way of really broadening and improving care. And so he's going to share his thoughts and what he's done and allow us to open it up to about 45 minutes of dialogue afterwards. I talked to Dr. Um, Gardner Buckshaw. She uh, informed me that uh, her team, as well as the uh, group in farm, sorry, uh, in psychiatry have come together and used some available dollars. And on December 2nd, we will have Patch Adams here on our campus. For those of you who've seen the movie with Robin Williams from 1998, uh, you'll know who he is. He's a well-recognized physician, comedian, clown, who really um, uses humor as a way to improve healthcare delivery. If you haven't seen the movie, it's a very good movie with um, Robin Williams. Our students will be sponsoring the screening of that movie during that same week. So I encourage you also to come to that event. Uh, this is a very renowned individual and it's a great opportunity to see him right here on our campus. And finally, um, I want to remind everybody that we're going into the holiday seasons. This really starts with Halloween, moving on to Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas, and a number of other um, religious holidays. Uh, I, as we do that, you, Remember that it's getting dark, and when it gets dark, um, seasonal uh, depression can set in. Many people have a very difficult time around the holidays. They may be alone. They may have lost a loved one around the holidays, and it's a reminder of a, of a time that's not so pleasant. And then we're in the middle of a pandemic that's also continued to really wreak major problems on, a, on the behavioral health of our teams. So. Look out for each other, please. Reach out if you have help. Reach out to me, reach out to my office, reach out to each other. In the Air Force, we always said, have a wingman. That's somebody who's got your back, somebody who's flying by your side and watching for the bad guys coming. Uh, we want you to do the same thing for each other. And if you can't find somebody, then to reach out to uh, the leadership team at the university. We're here for you. We'll do everything we can to help you find yourself in a better place. With that, I'm going to stop and open it up for questions. Anything here in the uh, in-person audience? Elaine? I was, I was grateful for the, the vaccines that were uh, offered initially, and I'm wondering if uh, Neomet will have any opportunity to offer booster shots. I don't have the answer to that right now. I would um, ideally like us, like us to be in a place to do that. I believe SUMA will be offering some right here on the campus also. And those are always free um, for us to be able to get access to. If not, we'll look at more potential opportunities for us to do so. You do remind me to, to state what, what I failed to state a moment ago, which is that testing is available. We do have the Binax test kits. You can make an appointment in our clinic anytime it's open and we'll bring you in and at no cost, we'll give you a buy next test and we encourage you to do so. If you just want to have peace of mind, uh, if 
you are going to go visit family or friends during the holidays, and it's more of a no before you go opportunity, please schedule some time, come up and we'll do that. We also have the Binax home test kits available and you can come, you can grab those and do it yourself at home. Uh, the, uh, the test kits come from Portage County Health District and they, they do ask that you follow the online processes so that you're reporting positive cases, not just knowing yourself, but helping them to be able to track the number of cases that are present locally. Other questions? Let me see if there's anything online here. All of the signs for if you're not vaccinated, you must wear a mask have been removed. Has that requirement been lifted? So we are, we made the decision that in total, if you add our roughly 480 faculty and staff with the thousand students we have, we're at about 97% vaccinated on this campus. So given the new law put in place by the governor and the legislature, we could either make everybody face mask or we could tell everybody it's your option and your choice. We went with your option and your choice because our numbers are so low. We'll continue to monitor those. If they rise, we may have to go to full face masking. I think that won't happen now. We're watching a pretty big decrement take place. We are continuing to mandate face masks in the academic space, which is the South Corridor in all of the areas of that South Corridor. Um, that's from the area where the uh, police monitor is all the way to the entry point for Regula. Um, now, at other classroom spaces, it's still mandatory in the classroom, faculty, student, staff, regardless, regardless of your vaccination status uh, when a formal class is being held. This is not a formal class where our students, faculty, and staff are being forced to come in. Everybody has the option of coming in or going virtually to this. So here, it's your comfort level. We're also encouraging you to get tested. If you're not vaccinated, you're encouraged to get tested. If you are vaccinated, you're encouraged to get tested. So it is not mandatory outside of those areas. Our students from Biomed have had a mandate to wear them from their leadership team. So typically you will see them in the new center, uh, which is really a community area accessible by anybody uh, inside or outside of the campus. You'll see that they face mask. And if you're wondering why so many of the students are, they've got about, little over 560 students and they are all doing it. Making masks optional is a problem for people who have either very young or otherwise compromised people in their lives. I, I understand the concern and the comment. Um, you are assume if you're wearing this and you have this concern, you are vaccinated. You're vaccinated wearing a face mask on a campus that's 97% vaccinated. Uh, so your risk is incredibly low. You can continue to practice social distancing and require that of others around you. And you can wear the face mask and that's going to help you. We've also implemented for the majority of people, the uh, ability with your supervisor's approval to be able to continue to work um, up to two days a week remotely, which also reduces your footprint on this campus. It was really a balancing act and understanding how safe we are. As I noted, we've had one case uh, over the course of the last week, and those numbers are continuing to come down. We've never have, had a large number on this campus. And then finally, rumors have it that the conference center will be shutting down the ballrooms uh, used for what will now be strictly classrooms. Is that true? No, that's not true. Um, Mary Taylor and I are looking at what we can do with the new center. I think I've shared before, and I have shared with all of you before, that if you ask me a question, I'm gonna be as transparent as I possibly can with you. If I can't share the information, it's because it's strictly confidential. It may be a legal case. It may be somebody's personal information. Uh, if you ask me, for instance, what Joe Smith gets in salary, I can't tell you that information. Uh, but I will, I have been pretty open that the new center was constructed under somewhat of a flawed business model. It's a beautiful space and it really defines our campus. Everybody you bring into it talks about how amazing this campus looks. So that's been a big plus for us. The reality is uh, 
Um, when you look at debt service, we have about $84 million in bond debt on that space. And we've get, that means very large payments have to be made to the bondholders. We lose a little over, at least most years, we've we calculated over $5 million a year on that space. And that's even with the few events that are taking place. So we're looking at what we can do to reduce those losses. I would say that we're a university. Our focus is education, research, and some community service around that. Um, we are not really a organization that was set up to be a conference center like a Marriott. And because of that, we've not done a great job in filling the doors in reducing the overhead burden. So part of the dollars we make, and remember, the vast majority of the dollars to support this university come from tuition and SSI or state subsidy. There's a little bit, and it's a pretty small amount from philanthropy and research dollars that come in are required to be used only for the research being conducted. So that's not in our new center. That means we're paying for that loss with those other dollars, mostly tuition and SSI. So we're looking at models we can create to reduce those losses. One of those that we've played with is if we had an expansion in graduate programs, especially high value graduate programs that use that space during the daytime, Monday through Friday, could we offset the major losses and then make it available for evenings and weekends for conference services, for our own events, for external events, we're just exploring the opportunity. We've made no commitment at this point. Uh, we need to do something that makes sense. We've been really fortunate that over the last two years uh, with the implementation of Lean Six Sigma, as well as some of the low hanging fruit for dollars that we can save um, in really, in ways we should be thinking about, for instance, uh, the finance team restructuring our bonds. Uh, those can save a lot of money for this university. In fact, uh, We've, we've saved tens, uh, 10 plus million dollars in losses over the past two years, spending money on things that are really not part and parcel of who we are as an organization. And we returned those dollars to the budget, which is why everybody got increases in their budgets this last year. And we're looking for what's the next thing we can do to make us more fiscally responsible uh, and maybe eventually get to the point that we've got this campus where it needs to be. I think all of you would note places that need improvements and we've got those coming. That's deferred maintenance and improvements to the campus. But once we get everything where we'd like to be, then we assess where are we with tuition levels and uh, do we have to keep up with consumer price index, you know, inflation with those. Uh, we maintained it at a lower rate this last year than the other universities in the state did. While tuition went up about 1.8% here, most universities went up over 3.2% in the state of Ohio. So it's a balancing act for us. How do we keep this affordable? How do we maintain everything we have? And part of it is not just new dollars coming in, but not wasting the dollars that we currently have. That's all I see uh, on the questions. Any others here? No? Well, thank you. Uh, for the opportunity to uh, sit and talk to you today. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question, you'd like to, you're somebody who doesn't like to put their hand up in the air. Um, I understand that. So please seek us out, send me an email. Uh, I do want to hear from you. The answer isn't always going to be, yes, we're going to do this, but at least I can explain to you the rationale why we may or may not, may not be doing something. So thanks again and uh, have a great week.